Yeah, we might have we may have some late comer, but I think we'll get started. The archive was full of a lot of stories when Black History Month rolled around. We're, the archive was full of a lot of stories about Blacks and African Americans in Pensacola <laughs> and and the region. And uh, so today I want to share two stories of two two African Americans from Pensacola who had the propensity to actually change history in a big way. They're going to be people you've never heard of before. When I was in, uh, when I was growing up, there used to be a show on PBS TV called Connections. It featured a historian or speaker named James Burke. And what he, and I understand he's back again with a new series on the same topic. And they were stories about how history uh, events tied, tied themselves together um, because of the, because of knowledge and because of, of different kinds of things. And so I'm going to do a little bit of that, too. There were also, when I was growing up, a newscaster called Paul Harvey from, my, from Chicago. And Paul Harvey started doing the rest of the story. And he would do long, historic little spiels, and then he would let you in on the kicker on the end. And I'm going to have a little bit of that today, too. Well, we're going to start with the uh, Battle of Quebec in September of 1756. And British forces under General James Wolfe scaled the walls of cliffs over the city of Quebec and defeated the French army, which would then control of Quebec. And as a result of this, of this battle, in 1763, the Treaty of Paris was ended the French and Indian War in North America, and it gave Britain, Great Britain, all the holdings of present-day Florida, Spanish West Florida, including uh, Western uh, uh, Louisiana, and also Upper Canada and all the French, some of the French holdings overseas, and all this became became English control. And um, France was very bitter about these losses, and because France was bitter about these losses. Fifteen years later, they would come in on the American side in the in the Revolutionary War against England. But being part of England, this is this area. Well, skipping ahead a few years, I have a picture here of a man named Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Manfield. And in June of 1772, he is presiding over a case in London where a man named Charles Stewart, Charles Stewart had been receiver general of custom in British North America, and he came back to England with his captured, with his slave, James Somerset. Stewart had been a Scottish Scotsman, and he had immigrated to America, and he became a first a merchant and then a custom officer in Boston in the province of Massachusetts Bay, a British crown colony. And in 1749, he purchased a young slave boy captured from Africa by the name of James Somerset. He taught him English and other things, and he became Somerset's assistant. And so when Stuart returned to England, he took his slave Somerset with him. And in London, Somerset came, in, came into um, contact with other free blacks and abolitionists and in 1871, he ran away. October, he, he ran away from his master, and he was recaptured. And Stuart was just furious that his slave had run away, and he had him imprisoned on a ship bound for Jamaica with orders to sell him to a plantation. And a group of free blacks raised some funds, and they made a, an appeal to the court on his behalf in January of 1772. And he was set free pending a hearing before Lord Manfield, the Chief Justice of England. Now Somerset had been now Somerset had been was represented by a number of attorneys, and they argued that the while colonial law of America might permit slavery, the common law of England and the laws of Parliament did not. And they argued, and the Stuart's attorney argued that previous court decisions had declared, had recognized slaves for property, and it would be dangerous to free the black people. Nevertheless, in June 1772, Judge Manfield issued this opinion. 
The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reason, moral or political, but only by positive law, statute, which preserves force long after the reason, occasions, and time itself from whence it was created is erased from memory. It is so odious, slavery is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but law. Whatever inconveniences therefore may follow from the decision, I cannot say this case is allowed or approved by the law of England, and therefore the black man must be discharged. In its broadest intent, his opinion meant that no master could take a slave by force or force him or her to be sold abroad. But while his ruling did not abolish slavery, it did bring an end to the holding of slaves in England and also led to the abolishment of the trade of slave trade throughout the British Empire in 1807 and abolished the slave trade and then abolished slavery in total by 1833. I can't emphasize enough that this is the beginning point. This is the case that led the few to the abolishment of slavery throughout the entire British Empire. Now, what does this have to do with Pensacola, you might ask? Well, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. This is a picture, a painting of Sir John Lindsay. Now, after England acquired Florida, it was divided into East and West Florida, with Pensacola being the capital of West Florida. And a colonial British government was established along with a military force. Among these was this man, Captain John Lindsay, who served on the HMS Trent from 1757 to 1763 as part of the West Indies Squadron. Um, from his military actions in Havana, he was knighted, so he became known as Sir, Sir John Lindsay. Now, as part of the British government, he was granted a town lot in Pensacola on the east-west end of downtown. And while here, he had also had a young slave, a slave woman named Maria Bell. And in 1761, she gave birth to his daughter, Dido. In other words, a British nobleman, a knight, had sex with a black woman in Pensacola, his slave, and gave birth to a daughter named Dido. Now, it appears that Maria Bell, the slave, was given her freedom around 1772, and Sir John Lindsay's lot in Pensacola was conveyed to her in 1773 and confirmed in 1774, saying that she was a free Negro woman by then formerly of Pensacola, but now residing in London. When John Lindsay returned to London in 1765, he took his daughter with him, and he entrusted her care to the raising of his uncle, William Murray, Earl of Manfield. Dido was baptized in 1766 with her full name of Dido Elizabeth Bell, the bell coming from her mother, Maria Bell. And the baptismal record said that her mother was Maria Bell and her father was Sir John Lindsay. Now, she was raised in the household of William Lindsay. Uh, she was raised as an educated woman along with his niece, which, who would be actually her cousin, Lady Elizabeth Murray. And her role in the house might have been more of a playmate or a lady companion, but she was the illegitimate, illegitimate daughter of a nobleman and a slave in an English society that was often built on uh, status, caste, and nobility. Manfield became very, especially fond of her, and as she was educated and trained, he, she often became working as his secretary, so she was highly, highly educated. Now, she spent 31 years in this house called Kenwood House, where she was treated as a family member, though some accounts say that sometime only when the family were present, and she was granted her freedom in his will in 1793. In his will, he gave her 500 pounds and a 100 pound a year annuity. She later married and had three sons. In 1779, the family commissioned a painting of her, Dido, and her cousin Elizabeth. And this is that painting. 
It is unique in 18th century Brit Britain, depicting a black woman and a white woman as near equal. It showed Dido beside her cousin Elizabeth, lightly behind her. She carrying a basket of fruit, wearing a turban with a large ostrich feather. Elizabeth is portrayed with great vivacity, while her cousin appears more sedate and normal. Formal. Most women are wearing gowns, gowns reflecting their high social society status. They're standing together on the ground of Kenwood, and her cousin's hand lies gently on Dido's arm, suggesting affection, and possibly they were walking the ground together. And Dido actually, uh, I mean, Elizabeth is holding a bird. Dido holds a plate of fruit. But nevertheless, this painting illustrates the high fashion conscious style and that they are both well-dressed and they are upper class. So we have an upper class family in England where the distinguished naval commander and, and, fam and family members returned from overseas where he has fathered a child with an illeg illegitimate slave of the slave, illegitimate, but instead of dismay, disinheritance, or ostracization, she has been accepted as an equal in the household, raised with education and love, all regardless of data, parental history, and skin, skin color. This is fictionally portrayed in the movie Bell. I'll mention that in a minute. But coming back to the Chief Lord Chief Justice of England, the one who issued the note against slavery, he actually actually he and William Murray are the same man, and therefore he is master of Kenwood. And looking back at the time and the laws and so forth, I can't help believe that this integrated household, possibly the first in England greatly influenced Manfield and the Chief Justice's decision in the slave uh, decision to a disavow slavery. In any case, this young girl from Pensacola and an illegitimate daughter of a nobleman and a slave, through her actions in this house, her friendship, her love, her affection, and raising her as a nobility, as a noble child, I believe greatly influenced the change that caused the wiping out of slavery in the entire British Empire. And some of this story has been told in this movie called Bell. And it's not totally historically accurate, but it's close enough that I certainly would urge people to take a look at this. Anyone have any questions so far about this person? Okay. Well, we'll go on to our second story. When I uh, <clears throat> when I came to Pensacola in 1981, this is what Old Christ Church looked like down in Seville Square, founded as an Episcopal church. And when they did historic res preservation, they actually took it back to an 1871 period because if they had left it at the time period the church was built, in the 1820s, they would have had to take, take down the tower and that building on the back. And so historic preservation, you try to preserve the uh, element that you have. In any case, I misspoke, but this church was built in the 1833-1834 period. In 1836, the Episcopal congregation began allowing jo Reverend Joseph Saunders to have a Sunday afternoon service in the church for blacks. And that church took its name Lion Chapel Mission. Then in 1903, when Christ Church, Christ church moved to its new building on Wright and Palafox, and the old Christ Church was turned over to Zion Chapel, which changed its name to St. Cyprian Episcopal Church. And that church met here until 1928 in this building and uh, when they built their, a new building. In 1924, Reverend Edwin F. Shirley came to Pensacola, become the new, became the new minister of St. Cyprian. He had a long career at the church. He was serving there for 39 years, retiring in 1964 at the age of 78. 
he continued his mission in the church uh, because he, um, after retiring, he moved to Fort Lauderdale and served in several positions, other positions serving the community. And in, he died in 1982 and is buried in Fort Lauderdale. Now, and under his tutelage at St. Cyprian, they built a new built church at the corner of La Rua and Ruth Streets and held their first service here in 1930. In the 1930 census, he is listed at age 42, living on West La Rua with his wife, Della, age 30, and three sons, Calvin, Calvin, it spelled uh, with a K in the here, here, but other sources have a C. Um, H, which is, um, anyway, Calvin H, Edwin S, and Donald W, who's age three. Now, Stella, like probably like most ministers' wives, she raised the children, assisted with activities in the, with the church, and uh, supported her husband. And sadly, uh, she died in 1936. And her funeral was held in 1936, and she was buried here in St. Joseph's Cemetery here in Pensacola. And then left, that left her three sons, 15, 13, and 6. Now, the newspaper did not list her cause of death, but most likely it is childbirth. Because we have a picture of, of Reverend Shirley around about 1937, and you see the new baby on his lap named Maurice. And since he did not marry again, it probably is his fourth son, and she probably passed away in childbirth. It's not mentioned in the account. It's not mentioned in any record that I can find. Now, this 1937 shows all of them, and he probably did not marry again. He probably relied on hired help or other people to, to, to step in and uh, be surrogate. Uh, parent. Now, the third son, Donald, he begins uh, playing piano at an early age, sometime at church, and showing his proficiency around age nine. There are stories that he traveled to the Soviet Union to study music theory at the Leningrad Conservatory of Music. I have not been able to verify that. It seems like a really strong, long, and expensive trip for a child, and so I, I kind of hold that in kind of a historical, uh, uh, not knowing whether that's true or, or not. In any case, he attended Washington High School in Pensacola, and he often played with local orchestras and played concerts and other kinds of things. By 1945, after leaving here, leaving here and, and heading to Northeast for a career. By 1945, he made his debut with the Boston Pops, playing Tchaikovsky, among other music. I managed to get a copy of the program. And clearly, musicians are segregated during this period of time. And in 1945, it's Colored American Night. <clears throat> and look down, he is, he is noted as playing, um, looks like Darth Bangle Banner, Brahms, uh, Scherzo, and also Tchaikovsky's first movement. Now, his career is hard to trace in the 1940s and 50s, and there are conflicting stories, sometimes without attribution or explanation. His family said he had three doctorates and spoke eight languages. And while he was in Chicago for a period of time, he got married and later divorced. In an interview, a later interview in life, he said he chose music over marriage. But we do, various sources say he attended Howard University, that he got doctorates in psychology and liturgical study, taught at the University of Chicago. Now, he was discouraged. Most sources say he was discouraged from being a classical pianist, mainly because white audiences and probably segregation would not come to concerts featuring a black pianist in his time, and also black audiences would not listen to classical music. So this, there's a racism in this time. He complained in an interview in 2007 that people expected that because he was black, he would only play jazz music, and probably that's why it led him to turn 
his piano playing into a mixture of classical, pop tunes, and Negro spirituals. In the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, he formed a trio, and he went on the road and traveled throughout uh, throughout the United States. Uh, this is a ad from the Texas newspaper where he performed group performed in in Austin, Texas, and there are many. There are hundreds of other performances in newspaper. He knew Duke Ellington, <clears throat> and. Um, as you can see, he uh, his trio played with Duke Ellington's orchestra. There's a this article in New York Times Daily News in 1954. Duke Ellington once said he'd give up his bench at the piano to let Shirley take the reins. And then he played with Duke Ellington at Carnegie Hall in 1955. There's an article about the Symphony of the Air means this was radio broadcast, and his concerts and things that he did were being broadcast throughout the uh, country on the on the radio. Um, <clears throat> the two 1955 TV uh, radio notices note that one of them, um, he on the um, he on the Dave Garraway show uh, toward the bottom on the left side, and he on the Arthur Godfrey show. I grew up with radio, so Arthur Godfrey a very familiar very familiar name with me. Here from El Paso, uh, Harold. Uh, newspaper, 1958, and notice he on the show, NBC News on the Hour with Sammy Kay, Robert Mitchum, and the Don Shirley Trio. Um, and he also produced uh, record albums. And uh, actually have a, I actually have a couple of them here in the uh, archive that I've been able to acquire. Um, <clears throat> actually, if you go into Amazon Music today and you type in Don Shirley, some of his music is on Amazon Music, and you can listen to some of his uh, some of his concert there. He um, also was sometimes you could ring in the New Year with him. This is from the Shreveport Journal, noticing the Waldorf winging in the Grand uh, New Year thing with uh, Don Shirley Trio, uh, not not at the Waldorf, but at other New Year. Ventures at the time, and throughout the fifties and sixties, as I said, he appeared throughout the United States in various aspects and and so forth. And one of my favorite pictures of him. They use this on all the record albums as well. In 1955, he moved into the artist colony of Carnegie Hall. Now, Carnegie Hall, when it was built in 1891, of course, was financed by Andrew Carnegie, which is why it has his namesake. But Carnegie realized that, that, that a concert hall needed income. And so Carnegie Hall was built in 1891. And then behind it, two tower editions were built in 1894 and 1896. <laughs> They had a. They had some 170 apartments, and they included ballet studios, an author club, uh, other kinds of things for working artists. And they charged rent, and the income from these helped support Carnegie Hall. And some people spent their entire lives living in these studio apartments. Some of them people lived there during their training. They included people like Denzel Washington, Mira Sorvino, Michael Douglas, and many others. People who lived and worked there also included Isadora Duncan, Agnes DeMille, Marlon Brando, Leonard Bernstein, and many others. In 1960, there was an attempt to tear down Carnegie, the entire Carnegie Hall, and violinist Isaac Stern led a successful public campaign and the city of, of New York bought the property for $5 million, creating the Carnegie Hall Corporation. In 2007, 2007 the corporation announced plans to tear down all the, the uh, apartment structure. And there was a 10-year war of lawsuits and litigation with the last person being evicted from those apartments in 2014. Most of the studio part, and by then only rented for like $650 a month. And finally, to induce some of the last tenants to leave, they paid for them 
uh, the difference between their rent and what their new rent for the rest of their life. In an interview in 2007, Dr. Shirley said he had been residing in the apartment since 1955 or from some 62 years. He was then 80 and in poor health and one of the tenants fighting eviction. In a New York Magazine interview in 2007, he noted he started on the eighth floor in 1956 and now lived with his concert grand piano and ob other objects on the 13th floor. His apartment had 34 foot ceilings and it was rent control. And he was one of the last tenants to leave and they had to use a crane to get his concert grand piano out of the apartment in 2010. He told an interviewer in 2007 that it was a little hard to get around his apartment and his a piano studio because of all the objects and things that he had collected and gifts that he had received from, from many people. This Pensacola-born and raised and nationally known pianist died April 6, 2013, and this is his obituary from the New York Times. In 2018, Dr. Uh, Shirley made a concert, and many years before in the 50s, 60s, Dr. Shirley made a concert trip throughout the Deep South. And in 2018, his trip was memorialized with this film, The Green Book. And it featured the relationship between Dr. Shirley and his driver, Tony Vallelonga, known as The Lip. And it was a focus, if you watch the film, it's interesting, it's a focus on the problem of black and white relations in the South, the differences in lodging, the way they were treated. I would recommend this movie to anyone that wanted to see it. I would note, however, that black critics uh, derided this and condemned this movie as another white savior movie. In other words, the theme being the poor black man being saved by the white savior. Dr. Shirley's surviving brothers and his nephews railed against the movie because it had a number of accuracy. And there are quite a few things. If you haven't seen the movie, I'm going to ruin it a little bit for you, and I'm sorry, but I want you to understand the inaccuracy. He was at one time married and divorced. There are no indications in any interviews with him or anything from his surviving family that he was gay, which is kind of hinted at at the movie. The movie alleges he was estranged from his family, that was as far from the truth as you could get. Uh, he visited frequently Pensacola. His family one time dropped a concert tour in Miami to, to come to Miami where one of his relatives uh, was ill. He did make a tour of the South. But if the movie, you watch the movie, if only a few months, that wasn't true. It was actually a year. The family says he and his fam driver were never friends, just simply employees. He had a temper, and he would dismiss people right on the spot, even musicians if they were late or otherwise. And this is a picture of the real uh, Tony Vallelonga and, of course, Dr. Shirley. In any case, what impressed me about the film is that it does show the challenges of being a black musician in the white South before the civil rights movement. Dr. Shirley played many venues where he said he always had to enter by the back door um, and he mentioned that in some review. But he was an incredible musician, nationally known artist, and a major figure in Pensacola Black history. And I'm sorry that few remember this amazing man today. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, I just wanted to share these two vignettes with you. There are many other Black Americans in Pensacola's history. These are important to me because they are so uh, nationally inspiring, one affecting slavery across the British Empire, one affecting music throughout the United States. And I just, I just think they're incredible people. And I hope you think about them the next time you think about Pensacola's Black history. So thank you, and we'll see you again next month. Bye-bye. Okay.